stand together. We're going to raise our voices singing the song, This is Our God. those walls that we called sin and shame they were like prisons that we couldn't escape but he came and he died and he rose those walls are rubble now remember those giants we called death and Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. that took our breath away faith so weak that we could barely pray but he heard every word every whisper now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness never once did he fail couple announcements this morning and they're all in your bulletin. The first one is we're collecting eclipse glasses. So if you still have those, we're going to collect those and send them to Latin America. So the next um, solar eclipse or the next annular eclipse that's happening there in October, um, people can use them there that may not otherwise have them. Also, a couple of events are happening today. One is that we have Ryan Croft from Hilltop and he's going to be here during second hour to speak to families and kiddos who are um, camp age, so he will be down in the venue um, during Sunday school hours, so you're invited to join.
for that. And then also we have the Tim Menzies concert tonight at six o'clock and that's gonna be in here um, for anyone who is planning to come out. Um, there's no tickets or anything like that, but there will be a free will offering for Tim um, when he's here. And with that, I'm gonna read Psalm 27, one through four from the inside of your bulletin. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sunshine this morning and for another week to gather here together. Let our worship and conversations be pleasing to you. Be with John as he brings the message on this Sunday. Fill him, him us, and this place with your Holy Spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
King of kings, holy, you will always be. Uh, it's almost camp season, and our camp that our kids use, Hilltop Christian, uh, Christian Camp, what's, is that, what's it called now? It changed at one point, right? Yeah. I know. And uh, the camp director, Ryan Croft, is with us today, and his wife, Mala. And uh, you can come on up, Ryan. I'm not going to give you much of uh, an introduction. Just that after this, he's going to say a few words before I say a bunch of words. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit about camp. And then all kids and parents that have kids that might be of camp age, go over to the venue, which is the basement of the Family Life Center. And, and the whole uh, Sunday school hour, Ryan, Ryan's going to uh, talk to us. So that's good. I don't need to do any introduction except to say I really like Ryan and Mala. And that's good enough for me. It should be good enough for you, too. Thanks, John. Well, good morning. On behalf of our directors, our staff, our volunteers, and especially our campers, thank you. Thank you for what New Hope does to stand by Hilltop and help us to provide camp uh, for so many kids. The past three years, we have seen incredible growth going on at Hilltop with more and more campers coming every summer. Um, this past summer, we, ho we hosted 608 campers, which is about 24% above where we were pre-COVID. And so um, I'm excited with what God is doing. And the neat thing is, is of those campers, about 12% of them, about 40, uh, 44 of them tell us in their paperwork that they have no relationship with the church. They have no church home. They have no church background. And so we are seeing more and more of those kids come to camp. And it provides that opportunity then for us to share with them about Christ, to share with them about the most important decision, the most important decision that they can make in their lives. And that is to choose to follow Christ, to surrender to him, to get baptized, to become a Christ follower. And last summer of those 608 campers, 47 of them made that decision to give their life to Christ and get baptized. And that is worth celebrating. That is why we do what we do at Hilltop, to see young people come to know Christ, many for the first time and even more to grow deeper in their relationship with Christ. The entire week of camp is built around taking every single minute that we can to point them to Christ, to show them the love of Christ, and to make sure that they know before they leave who he is and who he needs to be in their lives. We tell people that at Hilltop, it's a place where a Christ and a great time go together. And we say that because we want the kids to have an awesome time, to have tons of fun and do lots of fun activities and different things. But at the center of it all, the most important thing is Christ. And that is what we point them to all the, the entire time. A couple things to update you guys about because um, you guys are a supporting church. And so you, are, uh, you own Hilltop. Hilltop belongs to our supporting churches. And we appreciate um, all that you do to stand by that. The past four years, we've been focus, focusing very heavily on a couple things. One, on reducing our debt. And I can tell you that we have paid down well over $100,000 in debt in the last four years while at the same time continuing to improve camp, to do new things. Uh, we finished up this winter, was a project in our kitchen. We completely remodeled the kitchen. Uh, we ended up also this spring, or coming out of winter, and just finished up a few weeks ago doing a, a major drainage repair on the front of our building, on uh, the front of the Stuckey's building, that now will hopefully stop that building from flooding every time that we get heavy rain. Um, and I can tell you that it's worked. The past three weeks of all that heavy rain, we have not had any water getting anywhere near the building. And so while it was unexpected and it's funds that we hadn't planned on spending, um, I'm, I'm happy to say we did not have to go in debt to do that. We were able to pull out of our savings and move forward with those things. 
Um, we are adding some new camp sessions this summer. Uh, if you know, last summer we offered a new paintball week of camp. Well, this summer we're adding a theater week of camp. So a week of camp that's focused on theater and drama. We have two young ladies that lead the drama department at Columbus Christian that are coming out to lead that this summer. And it's going to be a great and awesome week of camp. Our theme this summer is light. And I am excited for our campers to understand three key things. One, that Jesus is the light of the world and that the darkness cannot overcome it, that there is nothing that is greater than Christ. And then they need to know that, that Jesus is the light of life, that he brings life into our dead spaces, that he brings light and life into our hearts when we accept him and makes us children of God. And then the final thing that we're going to make sure our campers understand is we're going to challenge them where Christ tells us that we then are the light of the world. And make sure our campers understand that they, when they leave camp, they need to go back to their homes, their communities, their schools, and they need to be a light to shine Christ into those dark spaces so that those around them can see and know who he is. This summer is very heavily evangelistically focused on our campers understanding the gospel message and then challenging them to go out and then share that message of Christ. So if you have more questions, please feel free to join us in the Sunday School class. Um, I would love to talk more about camp and share more with you and answer your questions. Thank you, John. Ryan, as you will find out, you brought the perfect message and the perfect shirt to the morning. So let's get on with it. If everything goes as planned uh, during the rest of 2024, there are gonna be about a dozen sermons uh, from the Gospel of John. Actually, we got a head start during Holy Week, uh, had a, a couple of sermons from the end of uh, the Gospel of John. So we started at the end, but today we're gonna bounce back to the beginning and, uh, and start our journey where you should start. Uh, in John 1, called the prologue often, uh, and the first 14 verses go like this. I didn't do any slides for today, by the way, because the scripture, every time I started to do slides, I was writing out what's on front of the front of your bulletin. So if you have your bulletin, you can keep uh, referring, referring to that. Um, but the Gospel of John starts out this way. In the beginning was the word. You know what? Let's stand for the Gospel reading, please. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life and the life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That John, by the way, is John the Baptist, not the gospel author. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and, and through, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And then the climactic verse of that whole prologue, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the gospel. You may be seated. I, 
I, I was not prepared for uh, Monday's uh, eclipse. Oh, I had my Star Trek glasses. And I knew about what time the whole thing was going to take place. And I kept glancing at the sky all morning, hoping that the clouds would stay away. Uh, I certainly didn't want to miss this once in a lifetime thing. But other than that, I hadn't given it much thought, hadn't read uh, much on it. So what I experienced on Monday afternoon caught me completely off guard. Uh, first of all, I'll say the process surprised me. I, I had imagined that the whole thing might amount to about five quality minutes, you know, but discovered that there was a, a rather spellbinding hour ahead of the total eclipse. The drama of watching the, the moon edge its way in front of the sun. About an, an hour and 15 minute process. About the length of a slightly too long worship service, right? <laughs> But with, with all the feel, really, uh, of a worship service, eyes turned toward the sky, uh, a lot of silence, uh, awe, uh, and then the, the total eclipse itself, again, caught me completely off guard. I wonder how you would prepare for that even. Suddenly, in the middle of a clear sky day, you've got total darkness. The corona of the sun, the atmosphere of the sun that's always there but we never see, was just for a few minutes visible to us. Uh, the slight temperature drop. The breeze, was it there before or did I just notice it only when it suddenly got dark? And then the birds, uh, noticeably restless. I don't know if anybody else saw that too. Uh, it was like they were, weren't sure whether to sing their morning songs or their evening songs. And, and in that experience, it was for me at least as if uh, the past and the future just sort of dropped off the map for a moment and I was present to the moment like I rarely am. Supposedly, half of the people who see a total eclipse for the first time cry. I won't ask for hands. Chris and I watched it from our backyard and after it was over, a next door uh, friend, I think you would probably label him an agnostic, but he leaned over the fence and he said, that may have been the most spiritual experience that I've ever had in my life. Very special, Chris and I agreed, st still a bit mesmerized by what had taken place. I may be the most fortunate preacher in the world to have a total eclipse of the sun come up right before a sermon from John chapter 1. This is perfect. We deal today with some of the exact same things we were dealing with on Monday. The universe and light and life and what a perfect t-shirt. John starts out his story of Jesus not with a genealogy like Matthew. Uh, or with dreams in Bethlehem and shepherds like Luke does. But he begins his story of Jesus with a line from Genesis. Actually, the very first words in all of Scripture. In the beginning. But whereas the start of Genesis completes that with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth... John takes it a slightly different direction. In the beginning was the Word. And I say that's a slightly different direction because in Genesis 1, the account of creation there, 
uh, already has the word of God in an important role. There God speaks things into existence. God says, and it is. Things come to be by the power of a word that comes from God, but is something somewhat distinct from God. Just as the words that you hear me say come from me, but yet in another sense, they're somewhat separate from me. When you say, did you hear what John said? You're talking about the thing that came out of me, but it is not quite me, right? Well, John takes this distinction between a source of a word and the word itself just a bit farther by identifying the word as a character, a personified word, capital W, that was in the beginning with God from the very start. And in fact, was God. Everything that has been made was made through this word. And this word, John says, is life and the light of humankind. Unquenchable light. And obviously, this beginning of John uh, supplies theology with, with what will become the doctrine of the Trinity. But then, I mean, that's how we kick it off. But then after this cosmic start, John takes his story earthward and to John the Baptist, who in all four gospels is the one who announces the approaching light. What's up there comes down here. Uh, to make a comparison again with Monday, isn't it interesting how our eyes worked on Monday between the heavens and the earth? We kept going back and forth. Uh, there was a story that was playing out in the heavens, but our eyes kept shifting between what was going on up there and what was happening down here, how it was affecting our lives, how the shadows changed, uh, how the light manifests itself down here, how, how actually heavens are related to the earth, all of that was going on on Monday. So the word and its light was coming into the world, says jo the Gospel of John, and reminds us that John the Baptist was not that light, but was just the one who announced that light's coming into history. People were free to recognize or ignore that light, but all who believed in that word, who believed in that light, could become children of God, somehow reborn into a new uh, universe of light. And then there's the, the key verse of that prologue, everyone agrees. The word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. That's Merry Christmas from John. That's his version of the incarnation uh, story. Uh, different from the other gospels, but equally beautiful. And if you're an astronomer or maybe a scientist, maybe it's the most beautiful telling of the Christmas story. When I've preached from John 1 in the past, and I've done it quite, quite a few times, I've tended to end things right there, midway into verse 14, uh, that the word has come here and made his dwelling among us, literally tabernacled among us. Uh, but I think the experience of Monday has inclined me to highlight the second half of verse 14 this week. The word was made flesh and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The word glory comes up a couple of times in this second half 
of uh, verse 14. What's, what is glory? Well, the glory of something, I guess, is its radiance, its obvious beauty. It, it, glory is the awe-inspiringness of a thing, right? It's a word we don't rely on much in the modern world because for one thing, what's happened in modernity is that we all become judges of what is beautiful and what is glorious. It's all relative, so what's glorious to you may not be glorious to somebody else. But I, but I think along with that, we also, we also find um, rational, scientific explanations of things more solid because we live in a scientific world. We find it more solid than artistic, aesthetic language of beauty. So while you may have found the total eclipse quite glorious, the always opinionated Charles Barkley thought it was simply the sun blocking the moon, duh, whatever, right? <laughs> Although I'm very content to have grown up in the Stone Campbell tradition, that's the tradition of New Hope too, I confess that as a movement, we have tended to be just a little bit like Charles Barkley in that previous example. Our founders were fond of very uh, 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 basic, simple human reason. Uh, when examining John 1.14, the word that would have jumped out for our forefathers and foremothers was the word at the very end of verse 14, the word truth. If we're going to talk about God, let's stick to the facts and not feelings or perceptions or not warm fuzzies, not stuff like that. Let's go truth instead of glory. Back up a couple of words in verse 14. You've got the word grace. What is grace? Well, after the Reformation, certainly, again, within our own tradition, grace comes to be understood almost exclusively as unmerited favor. Grace is the good deal that we get that we didn't deserve. And the context for that kind of grace becomes the courtroom. Grace is acquittal when we are uh, facing a death penalty. And certainly that aspect of grace is important. But the Greek word for grace, charis, has, has a wide range of meanings, mostly not legal. In secular Greek, in everyday Greek usage, the word grace or charis uh, could be used to describe anything that brought about joy or pleasure or delight. So you could speak of a wonderful meal as a grace. Uh, it could be used to refer to a favor or to a gift or to some kind of generosity that was earned or not. It was just a, a good thing. Uh, it was often used to describe, just, just like we use the word to describe, it could describe elegant movement, the grace of the dancer, the, the grace of the horse running across a pasture, uh, the grace of the way that she said that, the way she put that into words, graciousness, that kind of grace. It could even refer to the overall demeanor of somebody that had an irresistible personality. Uh, our word charismatic comes from the Greek word for grace. So in Greek in general, charis was, was sort of an aesthetic statement, an artistic statement about things. It was a judgment about the beauty of a thing. Does that help us understand what's going on in the first part of the sentence? With this word grace, does John have in mind true information, the information that will unfold 
in the rest of his gospel, the story of the unmerited grace that we receive through Jesus? Or is the grace that he has in mind simply the beautiful movement of God? The way God can, in radiance, enter into the world. Uh, I can't help but think of Isaiah's response when he encountered the glory of God. Isaiah's response was, woe to me. I am ruined. It was not a truth he was dealing with. It was the glory, glorious experience of being in the presence of a glorious God. There's a fascinating experience I've had in my life that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, I've mentioned pieces of it before previously, so you will have heard at least parts of this before. But obviously, I'm still working through it, okay? A few years ago, John Bundick asked me to, to speak to a young adult worship group that he and some friends had put together. And the question he wanted me to speak about was, uh, how did you come to follow Jesus? Or alternatively, why do you continue to follow Jesus? Uh, and because I've basically been a Christian forever. Uh, the second part of it, why, am I st why do I stick with Christianity? Why have I stayed with Jesus all this time? You've heard me talk about this right before, sorry. I'm gonna do it again. But it ended up being a more complicated process than, than I imagined. Um, maybe I'm just not very self-aware and it made me be self-aware and I needed to, to think through it. But anyway, after much prayerful meditation, my answer boiled down to, to this. I still follow Jesus because he's the most interesting person I've ever met in my life. And this was all back in the Remember the Dos Equis commercials where the guy repeatedly was the most interesting man in the world and it was a chance to say, no, he's not. Jesus actually is. Since that time, I actually keep looking for better answers to that because more most interesting seems inadequate, seems sort of unsubstantial. Why do I say interesting instead of true? the truest person I've ever known? Or why, not I, why don't I say he is my savior, something on the personal salvation side of things? Why don't I say the, the best moral teacher, the best example of how to be a person in the world, uh, all of that? Uh, every time I've thought of a new thing, I, I think, yes, that's, that's good too, but it's not the answer that I, that I have really lived in, in my life. He is the most interesting person I've ever met. And I think John's gospel helps me understand what I've been saying when I've been saying that. For 60 some years, I think I have been drawn by what John calls the glory of Christ. He interests me. The light of him that attracts my attention and illuminates my days, it's that. His radiance. Uh, the fullness of the life that comes in moving toward him, it's that. Uh, the fact that, yes, he is truth, but he is a kind of truth that's beyond my capacity for understanding. I never fully get Jesus. Uh, he regularly catches me off guard, read through the gospels. He surprises me every time I read even what I've read before. Sometimes he irritates me, momentarily repels me, but then always draws me back to himself because he is the most interesting thing I've ever encountered in my life. 
It's an experience that I can only explain by saying I have been drawn into his beauty. It's funny right now because I'm talking about this using rational language because that's the only way preachers know how to talk. This seems like the kind of sermon that should be done in poetry or music or something like that. Because the glory of God is something that's not explained, but as John says here, it is observed. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We love him in large part because we behold him and see what he is. Now there are probably a dozen, maybe a hundred things in John's prologue that I flew by just to highlight this one point that I want to make today. And many of those things that I bypassed today will come up later in John's gospel, so hopefully we will touch on them in later encounters. But I think this is a good place to, to start a journey through John. Realizing that as we go through him, we are, we're observers. Privileged, not just with helpful information for our lives, although that's good too, but more important, we are privileged to behold the mysterious, majestic, compelling, beautiful glory of God that is in Jesus. And is there any value in that? In simply being overwhelmed by glory? Maybe there is. I ran across a study uh, that was conducted of 2.9 million people who experienced a total eclipse of the sun in 2017. And what researchers did after that eclipse was they analyzed data on uh, Twitter, social media platform, not what it used to be, by the way. Uh, but anyway, they analyzed that data. And what they did was they compared postings of those who were in the path of total eclipse over against those who were outside the total eclipse to see what differences they were. And they had a couple of findings that I think are related to each other. First of all, there was a lot more uh, awe language, A-W-E uh, language, for those who were in the path of totality. And of course, it's not hard to see why. I mean, that is your experience of an eclipse, I think. Oh, uh, what, that. And then there was also a more humble wording of things. Uh, for instance, people tended to say maybe instead of always, you know, proud, hard language of always like over against that, they would say stuff like, maybe, I think, here's my perception of this. As though the experience of the eclipse had sort of made them more modest about who they were in the world. And I think that happens to everybody who experiences it. And, and then the other thing was, and I think, again, it's connected to all this other, those who had been in the past, path of the total shadow, shadow tended to use we words, uh, us, instead of me, a lot more. Evidently, those experiencing the glory of the eclipse, well, that led people to think more modestly about themselves and realize that they were in the company of a lot of other people who had uh, gone through an experience uh, of greatness. They were in the company of fellow glory observers, maybe. 
I just point that out because the world seems hopelessly divided today, doesn't it? I mean, it's divided more now than it's ever, our nation at least, is divided more now than it's ever been in my lifetime. And Christians are not immune to that tension. In fact, Christians often contribute to the tension that is out there. And what I would think is when it's all about truth, when truth is the only thing that matters, well, we've all got our own truth and when we get entrenched in it, it leaves no room for anybody else who happens to disagree with us. But what if, what if to truth we added beauty? What if we focused on and experienced together the glory of the Lord, not just the doctrines of the Lord, all those are, those are important, I talk about them most weeks, but instead experience the person of Christ in all his glory, full of elegant grace, because that's how I see him moving through the Gospel of John, elegant grace and also truth. And what if we strove for lives that were not just right, but were also beautiful? I think this week I've got a better understanding. Dostoevsky had this line that I've never heard very well, I don't think, but it's the line, the world will be saved by beauty. So let's keep our eyes up. Interesting challenge as we head into our, our time of response and head toward the communion table. I mean, usually at this time we're we're trying to give you the kind of information of what is the, you know, what, what's the right thing to do, uh, how, to, how to escape hell, and that sort of, what if we viewed Jesus before us and just saw the experience of response, we just saw it as a walking into his glory and, and traveling into the beautiful life that he has for us. Actually, that's the way John's gospel talks about it. Who have 
to the table Oh, come to the table To the thief and to the doubter To the hero and the coward To the prisoner and the soldier To the young and to the older All who hunger all the last and all the first All the paupers and the princes All who failed you've been forgiven All who dream and all who suffer All who've loved and lost another All the chained and all the free All who follow, all who lead Anyone who's been let down All the lost you have to the table and come to the table good morning i'm going to make a quick announcement um, we are having our mother's tea this saturday from noon to two at the flc all we ask is you to bring a uh, finger food or whatever, something easy to eat. Uh, bring your daughters, everybody. If you could sign up in the back hall, that'd be great. Or let Bridget or I know that you guys are coming so we can get a head count. Thank you. I think it was last week that uh, Tim Jarnigan introduced himself, and I guess it's a good idea, people that don't know who we are when we get up here. Um, my name's Jack, and uh, I won't tell you anything else. Um, <laughs> talking about the... Uh, stand by. Talking about the... Uh, Event Monday. I'll also need my my cup and communion. Um, would you say that it was a, a, a happy coincidence that we all went to the same parking lot today, um, or a happy coincidence that we're all here today? I mean. There's lots of reasons why we are, and it goes back into history why each and every person is here. There's all kinds of things that led us here, that led us to be who we are uh, on this planet, and some of that led you to be here today. Um, I was watching, just for a minute, I watched a very, a very smart man, uh, astrologer. He was being asked on a TV show, and the, and the person that was asking him the question, made sure you understood that they already knew the answer to this. But he said, tell the folks at home, why, do those, why does the moon and sun line up almost perfectly like they're the same size? And he said, well, and if I've got this right, he said, the, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. And he said, by a happy coincidence, the sun is 400 times farther away from the earth than the moon. 
That was a happy coincidence to this man. And I immediately ran to my favorite passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart, do not rely on your own understanding, and all things acknowledge him and he will set your path straight. Another thing after, in all things acknowledge him, in all your, in all your ways submit to him. Um, did you notice, and I never really did until I started this thing today, was that there's three commandments Three commands and one promise in that uh, song, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. Do not rely on yourself. And all things go to Him. And the promise is, and He will set your, your path straight. Why does He want us to not rely on ourselves? Well, I Googled it. Didn't believe myself, so I Googled it, and, and I saw the words, human understanding is always subject to error. What appears to be right, a right choice may be the wrong choice. But the Lord sees the big picture, and he always knows what is best for us. Um, I find that to be the answer to the man who thought that it was a Happy coincidence. Um, I don't. I understand uh, science and, and uh, religion and uh, things don't always jive. And, and uh, but you need to go to the Lord. It's just exactly why we need Him so badly. Um, here in the last month or so, we've had a lot of things happen on our street, and and I think more than ever, um, the people that live on our street have gone to uh, the Lord. Uh, to, and I think that's an example of what we all do every day. I think, I think it made me want to go there faster and uh, quicker to uh, not rely on what I hear around in the world. Hebrews 4.12 teaches that the Word of God is, a living, is living and active. Let's consider what it means that Scripture is active. Think about Psalms 119-105. We often approach God's Word as if it were passive, like a flashlight we hold in illumin to illuminate the steps ahead. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. However, that's not the picture God gives us of it being a lamp that re reveals our path. Nehemiah 9-12 explains that when the Israelites wandered into the wilderness, you led them with a pillar of fire by night to light them their way for them which they were to go. In other words, the Lord's leadership was active. No Israelite held the pillar of fire or pointed it in a certain direction. Rather, through it, God led them in the path of his will, taking them, taking turns, taking turns that they would have never taken on their own. The same is true for scripture. If you always approach thinking, how can I solve my problems? You'll find answers. However, you won't experience it all that it has to offer. Instead, open the word saying, Lord, lead me to do your will. Certainly he will guide you in the ways that defy imagination and bring joy to your heart. He is the light.
Dear Lord, we come to you to the table. What we experienced on Monday was something that you created at creation. You set these things in motion. You set these planets, the moon and the sun, to do what it does intentionally. And you gave us a moment, maybe like no other moment we'll ever see in our life. It was an easy place to see it. It was in our backyards, right where we live. Dear Lord, we come to you at the table at this time to do, also do what you said to do was honor and remember you during the crucifixion and what you've done for us. Amen. The Lord broke, Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body. Take. And he held up the glass and he said, this represents my blood for the forgiveness of your sins.